Hey, Sonny here, and today we're going to look at eight more ways that you can loop through collections of data in JavaScript. If you haven't seen the previous video, uh, the link will be somewhere on the screen at the moment, and I do suggest that you take a look at that video first before proceeding on to this one. Now, the eight ways that we're going to look at today all fall under an umbrella term known as a higher order function. Now, for anyone who's not aware of what that means, it's, uh, it's basically just a function that calls another function. Um, higher order functions kind of package this into a nice, neat way that makes it easy to use, um, easy to compose as well, which is one of the key uh, benefits of using these higher order functions, uh, i.e. it means you can chain them together so you can use one type of function and use another type of function. And you'll see in the examples that we cover in a, in a moment, ways that you can use that. So for most parts in this video, we'll be using the same response array that we used in the previous video. So just to remind you of what it looks like, it's basically an array with three objects inside of it. Each object has, a, a, for some parts, we will also be using the add key to object function that we also used. It basically just attaches an additional key value pairing onto any object that matches the criteria inside of the function. So the first type of higher order function we're going to look at is the for each loop. Now chances are you've probably seen this one before. It's um, similar to a for loop, but the key difference here is that with for each, we don't need to initialize a variable or keep track of its changes throughout the life cycle of the loop. So this makes it, uh, well, I guess easier to use than a for loop insofar that there are fewer things that you need to keep track of during its process. So for our for each function, you can see here that all we do is take the response variable and at the end of it, we just attach for each. We then initialize a function inside of it. Now this is basically what we mean when we're saying higher order function. It's because it returns a function inside of it. We pass in one parameter of object or OBJ for short, and then we just run the add key to object function. Uh, now, if we wanted to shorten that and use ES6 arrow functions, we can do by just writing it in the way that you can see on the screen now. In fact, we can actually just write this as a one line function if we wanted to. Now, there may be instances where you uh, cannot use this one liner, uh, and that would be if your for each function needs to handle multiple operations inside of it. So for example, if we also wanted to console log the object, the next three that we're going to look at were all introduced in 2015 with the arrival of ES6 or ES2015, uh, and that's the map filter and reduce functions. Now the map function provides an easy way to loop through an array and pull out a specific piece of information from each item inside. So as you know, we've got three objects inside of our response array. Therefore, we'll loop through each object and grab a value out of it. In our case, what we're going to do is grab the link from each one. So that would be the href key, and we actually just want the value of that. So you can see here, we've created a variable called URLs, and it is equal to response.map. And then just like how we did with the previous arrow functions for say for each, uh, we just use an arrow function and apply it to obj.href. And what that does is it will just go through every single object in the response array, pull out the href value on it, and they will all end up inside of a new array inside of the URLs variable. The filter function provides an easy way to loop through an array, provide some form of condition, and then filter any items that don't match that condition. So it works similar to how the map function does in terms of how you initially set it up. Um, now the difference here, of course, is that we pass a condition. What we've done here is we're just going to pull out all of the articles from our response. So we create a variable called articles. The value of articles becomes response.filter uh, and then run the same thing. So we've got obj as the parameter being passed in. And what we're looking for is obj.format. And we're going to say, okay, if it's equal to article, then grab that value. If it's not, then we're not going to grab it. 
So what we could expect to happen here is that if you remember our response array has three objects in it and only one of them is an article. So you can expect articles to just return one article. These conditions just work in exactly the same way as they do outside of these higher order functions. So for example, if I wanted to pull out everything that isn't an article, I could just invert that condition. The next function we're going to look at is the reduce function. Now I've made a slight change to our response array here. Uh, you can see on the screen here that I've added a duration key to each object in there. Now reduce can be useful when you want to do things such as obtaining an overall value by cycling through each object and just accumulating a particular value from there. Now the thing about higher order functions is that they become even more powerful when you combine them together. So what we're going to do is create a variable called overall duration and the value of this will be response.map and return object.duration. That will give us an array with just the values for the durations. Now what we can do is chain another higher order function onto that map. Now chaining is possible because map, filter and reduce are all functions that can be used on arrays. So you can imagine that after the map part of the function has been called, this is effectively what reduce is being called on. Now the thing about reduce is it can take up to four different parameters where required. Now in our case we only need to use the first two. So the first is what we call an accumulator. Now this is basically just the value that will store our final value and is the one that we'll be adding our duration values to. This is the value that is returned at the end of using a reduce function. The second is the current value. And by that we mean the current value being passed into the function at the time. Um, so if you're looping through it, or which a reduce function will do, that current value will just keep changing to the, the next value and the next value to you know whatever's being passed in. In our case, you can see that in our reduce part, we've got accumulator and current value as the two parameters. And all we're doing is adding current value to accumulator. Doing so will just return the sum of those three values that were passed in. Now, as mentioned, we can provide additional customization and functionality by making use of the additional parameters available to the reduce function. Now, as we haven't used them here, accumulator actually just defaults to the first value inside of the array that we've passed in and current value defaults to the second value. Now that might seem a little bit unintuitive at first because you might think, okay, maybe uh, accumulator just defaults to zero and then we start passing in those values of five, 60 and 20 to it. But it doesn't work that way if you don't give it an initial value. But if we want to provide an initial value, what we will do is write our function like so. And as you can see at the very end, uh, we've got accumulator to plus value, but then we've got comma and zero. Zero here will be the initial value passed in. If we do that, then the accumulator and current value work in the more intuitive way that you would imagine, where accumulator just defaults to zero, and then we start passing in those values. The next three functions that we're going to look at are includes, sum, and every. Now the reason why we're grouping these three together is because they all return Boolean values rather than the previous ones that we were looking at which return the, well, the actual data. Now the includes method determines whether an array includes a certain value amongst its entries and will return true or false as appropriate. So let's just imagine that what we want to do is find out whether our response contains any content that was made in the year 2020. What we could do maybe is write something like the following and you'll see in this that we're chaining these functions together again. So we've got const has content made in 2020 and that's equal to response.map and then we pull out the year from each value and then we just check to see if it includes 2020 as a value. In this case, it does because there is one object that was made in the year 2020 and so it will return true. And then maybe we could use that newly created variable as some form of conditional statement, such as what you've got on the screen where we've kind of done, you know, if content made in 2020, do something else, do something else. The sum method tests whether at least one element in the array passes the test implemented by the provided function. 
uh, and will return a Boolean value. This gives us some more customizability than the includes function that we saw a moment ago. Uh, here we can pass in a more specific condition similar to kind of like how we did with the filter function earlier. Uh, of course, the difference here is that uh, instead of returning the matching content that the filter function does, the sum function will just return a Boolean value of true or false as soon as it passes criteria given to it. What we mean by that is it will go through every item, but as soon as it hits a match, it's going to stop and just return true. The every method tests whether all elements in the array pass the test implemented by the provided function and again returns a Boolean value. So the key difference here between the every function and say the sum function that we saw a moment ago is that the sum function is going to return true as long as it finds at least one match, whereas the every function will only return true if every value passed into it is a match. And finally, there's one more that I'd like to take a look at, and that's the find function. Now, this can be useful when you're trying to find an object with a particular value. Now, you should bear in mind, however, that this will simply just find the first match and stop there. If you're simply just trying to find the first value or know that your content will only have one match, then you could use the find method. However, if you were trying to return all of the matching values, then it would be better to use something such as filter. If you're in a situation where you don't know how many um, matches you're going to have, but you just want to return them all, then use the filter function. Okay, and there you have it. So eight different ways that you can loop through collections of data in JavaScript. Uh, hopefully you found that useful. Um, I certainly did anyway. Um, but <laughs> That's not even, I don't even know why I'm laughing. And if you found that useful, then be sure to subscribe to the channel for more similar content in the future. Uh, do all the fun stuff that people do as well on the internet, like liking the video, put some comments on there, share it around, do all that good stuff. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.